Hey, it's Adam with the Backpack Theory Podcast, where we unpack past experiences to help define a better future. And today, we are going to be unpacking sobriety is the adventure. My guest on today, her name is Natasha Smid. New Natasha growing up, came from the game, same group of people. She is a certified sober purpose coach through Jay Shetty University. She is a flight attendant in corporate aviation, has done that for six years. She is the co-host of the brand new Humanly Us podcast with her best friend. And today she's going to be on talking a little bit about sobriety and the journey that has happened in her life. Natasha, welcome to the podcast. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited. Dude, absolutely. And Natasha, I know that I've followed you on social media for years. I mean, we kind of grew up in the same groups and everything. Did some partying together back in the day. And, you know, watching your journey and just the glow that comes out of you and like the joy that comes out of you over just your life. Like, why don't you tell us a little bit about getting certified through Jay Shetty and Tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, what exactly you do and where you're at in your life right now. Yeah, yeah. With getting certified, I did that because when I got sober, there were so many people that helped me. And it was, I mean, I feel like without those people, I wouldn't have been able to be as successful on this journey in sobriety. So I wanted to be able to... And I had been following Jay Shetty like throughout my whole sober journey, just listening to his podcast all the time, reading his book, Think Like a Monk. Like he also doesn't drink either. And so I don't know. I just always felt like with him, I just, we aligned very well. And I was like, if I'm going to help people, like I want to learn from somebody that I align with. And so that's why I went through his program and just to have more, you know, be able to help people more, you know? Yeah, obviously I wanted to help people with my own experience, but I feel like going through an actual certification program, I would have more of that structure and just be more of service to people, you know, from learning from somebody who has been and is a very successful life coach and made an impact in the world. Absolutely, dude. I love Jay. He's great. I mean, dude, I listen, mm-hmm. I've been, I've seen him live great live. Like absolutely. Like I definitely cried at his live performance. Absolutely. Like oh, tears. I'm so like, jealous you went. <laughs> oh dude, it was, it, we went to, we went down in Dallas and it was for his eight rules of love, eight rules of love. That's what it is. It was for mm. that tour. And uh, I've listened to, I think like a monk it's, it's, it's a great listen. I've actually used quite a few quotes from that book you know, and he's just, just such a great dude and has a lot of just major impact. I love the sobriety journal journey as well that he has been on. And so Mm -hmm. I I totally get it whenever it comes to wanting to impact other people and really digging into that. So tell us a little bit about, I know that you just started this new podcast with you and your friend. Why don't you just give us a brief summary of what exactly that's about and what exactly you're going to be conveying to others? Yeah, yeah. So it's called Humanly Us Podcast. And yeah, it's brand new. We've only came out with like a couple of episodes, but we basically, thus the name, we just two best friends talking about this human experience. You know, we're, we're just these two souls who are working on ourselves and wanting to be our best selves. And like in the podcast, we talk about pretty much spirituality and like doing the inner work and then just also like showing the real and raw side of it too. You know, we want to be those people, those girls, like we want to feel like people are sitting there with us, just like the girls and just having chat about life, but obviously talking about, you know, how we can impact the world in a better way and just live out this human experience to the fullest. So. And that's beautiful because human connection, especially, whenever it comes to being vulnerable is something that's really tough to do. I mean, you know, one would argue whenever it comes to alcohol, it is actually an inhibitor to where a lot of people believe that alcohol is a way for you to tap into your true self. Like I know me, like whenever I worked in bar and club business, like I was always like, well, I got to have a drink here and there just so that I'm a little bit more fun so that people accept Mm -hmm. me a little bit more. So I'm not the only person not drinking something. 
And so I think that's awesome that you're sitting there and you're having these vulnerable conversations. And I think that society is really getting drawn more and more towards the word vulnerability, which is the whole reason I started this podcast. I know that in our, it was so cool in our pre-interview that I do with everybody, just the amount of like genuine, just energy that you exude was just, it's so refreshing being on this podcast and hearing people open up. And so if, if you haven't subscribed or checked out their podcast, again, we'll put a link in this video to go listen to a couple girls that are just kind of sharing energy and sharing their journey and being transparent and opening up. And so good luck on that. Hopefully I can come on at some time. I'm not pitching myself, but I'm just saying. Yeah. Yeah, we want to do interviews with people. So yeah, definitely. We'll add you to the list. <laughs> Thank you. I, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm flattered. So let's jump into sobriety. What is your definition of sobriety? Like what does sobriety look like to you? Sobriety looks like to me not needing, and that could be like, for me, my drug of choice was more alcohol, more so alcohol. I mean, I did other drugs, but like alcohol was the main the main toxic lover of my life during that time. And so, you know, I feel like it's different for everybody. But for me, it's living. That was like my toxic relationship, my toxic lover or whatever. So breaking free of that and, and basically, yeah, it is like a breakup, you know, like leaving that life and being able to live my life to the fullest and letting go of that addiction. And I feel like that can be different for everybody. Like it could be weed, it could be vaping, it could be Netflix, it could be a person. Just not, sobriety is basically not having to lean on a source outside of yourself to bring mm -hmm. you true peace, happiness, purpose. Dude, that's so good. I love that definition because, you know, alcohol, we like, a, there's a lot of things out there that people can lean on. I mean, and mm -hmm. there's a lot of avenues. There's a lot of distractions. There's a lot of unhealthy activities that are out there that you can get addicted to. And I love the fact that you're saying, Hey, you know what? Like sobriety is literally living free from any of these things. Your thing was yeah. alcohol, right? Like that was like what your escape was. But I mean, dude, pornography can be an escapism for some people. Weed can be an escapism for some people. The internet, being addicted to social media to where that's all you look at. There's actually even things like body dysmorphia to where you can get into fitness yeah. and go to the next level with it. I mean, there's a lot of things that you can get addicted to or build an unhealthy relationship with. And, you yeah. know, on this episode, you know, I know that we had talked a little bit about your moment because everybody has their moment in life where they realize, oh my God, whatever this thing is, it's more important. It's my God. It's my crutch. So why don't you tell us a little bit about the moment or the environment you were living in whenever you realized that you wanted to make this radical change? Yeah. So like the environment I lived in is actually the type of environment I feel like it's very normalized in society which I feel like is why throughout my journey, I've been able to reach, you know, the, the people that I have, because I was your typical, like go out every weekend with the girls, Friday, Saturday, go to the bars and the clubs, and then Sundays go and have brunch. And then eventually, you know, it's five o'clock somewhere during the weekdays. And then eventually it would be like, Oh, like, why not just drink during class or like, why not, you know, I, I would find, end up finding a reason all the time to drink mm -hmm. and it became mm -hmm. a daily thing or like wine. Wine is like the cool thing. It's like you get older and like, you know, yeah, you, <laughs> you get your glass of wine and like, yeah, we're just talking and talking about the same shit, like, you know, a million times for, <laughs> you know, so emotional, emotional dumping on each other. So I was like, you're what, that is like, what's normal to society, you know, like it's very... I, I've noticed that. And so the whole time when I was in that from 21 to 28 or whenever I got sober, like I was like, this is, this is life. Like, this is just how it is. You know, I was used to like living in the hangover state and the anxiety state basically. And like, you know, just cause I thought that's what was normal. I didn't know anybody else that was sober at the time. So that was like, I had never, I mean, there are times where I kind of would, you know, have my episodes and be like, I should slow down. But I never thought about actually 
completely stopping because I just didn't think that was a thing. Like, like I said, I didn't know anybody else that was sober. I mean, every now and then if I met, met somebody that was drinking, I would be like, you know, wow, how do you do that? Like, I would look at them like weird. <laughs> and so <laughs> when I always say it wasn't every time I drank was bad, but the times that were bad over the years added up and they became, it got to a point where, you know, that last day of drinking, I had a huge like episode and one of the worst that I've ever had. And it's like the weirdest thing to explain. And a lot of people, I feel like that hit their rock bottom, like don't even know how to really explain it that, but it's just like you, I hit this wall and it was like, it was almost like a movie. Like I could see my future. And I could see where I'd come from and where I'd been and how I was feeling. Then I could see my future. And it was like this realization of if I don't change my life, like I am either going to be dead or just be the shittiest person, like alive. Mm. Like I will hate Mm. myself. I can't even imagine hating myself even more than I already did at that time. But I was like, I could just see myself. It's not going to be good. Like I've got to make a change. And so. Yeah, that day, I was after the day, 4th of July of 2020 was the last day I drank. So it was the day after that. And I just realized, like, I was like, I need to make a change. And I, that day just decided I don't want to drink anymore. And I've stuck with it ever since. Dude, that's so, well, hey, thank you for being transparent and really unpacking a lot there. It is remarkable to me how you know, you hit 21 or eight, whenever your moment is where you start drinking and it kind of becomes the accepted thing. It's the legal version of, you know, it's the most legal version and most accessible drug out there. Mm-hmm. And I was listening, I told you earlier, I was actually listening to a video before I started this. It was an interview with an author named Julieth Grizzle. And she has a book called Never Enough. And she did a TEDx at Penn State University. And on on the interview that she was doing, she's she's a a neuroscientist and also a psychologist that majors in this because of her personal experiences. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, she really talks about the fact that from puberty to 25, your brain has this like purely nerve like, like this elastic state, like it's very like resilient. Like you can bounce back. Like everybody talks about the hangover post 25 is brutal. And there's a reason for that. Like there's, there's actual like scientific uh, reason behind that because a lot of people don't know this, but like alcohol is a neurotoxin and the way a neurotoxin works is it gets in your brain and it actually coats everything. Like the way that it works is just so fascinating and how fast it can hit you or how slow it can hit you is really depending on the person. But you know, during that period of puberty through 25, if you start habitually turning to alcohol as your escape or as your norm, that's where you can really develop these habits that then trail into your post 25 elastic mental state and can really become a mainstay in your life or a habit to where you start binge drinking more and more. And I think that beyond that, something that you said is, which kind of struck me as as aggressive as you said, you know, in these periods, whenever I'd have these hangovers, how could I hate myself anymore? Did you really like during that time? I mean, like, can you unpack like why, like, do you, do you feel like you hated yourself? Like, were you going through something leading up to that point? Yeah. Yeah. I feel like it, it was one of those things where I, it's that inner, you know, that inner child, like, I used alcohol to numb and cope with a lot, but then it was also one of those things where I feel like I didn't think my life was that terrible. Like, so I didn't feel like I had, and, and we, I feel like we talked about this when we were on the phone, you know, the other day, like, I just felt like, well, my life isn't that bad. So I really shouldn't be sad or or feeling this way. So it was like drinking, like helped me numb that. And, and I suffered from a lot of like social anxiety. When I was growing up, I was a very, very shy kid. I I didn't feel, you know, I always wanted to feel included and just, yeah, my anxiety was just really bad. So I feel like I would, 
drink to numb. And obviously that wasn't fixing anything. So over all those years of drinking to numb whatever uncomfortable feeling I had, I would, you know, it, that would build up over time where I would just, yeah, I did end up hating myself. I was so mm. insecure back uh. when I was drinking. And it, it didn't, like I said, it's a very progressive disease. Like it's, it's not like, when I first started drinking, yeah, I was 21. I was like, whoa, college, like just having fun. That's a cool thing to do. But now when I look back, reflecting on my life, I had just went through a breakup with my high school sweetheart of like, I don't know, four or so years. So it's like, yeah, at that time, I'm like, cool, college, it's a cool thing to do. It's normalized. But deep down, I was also numbing from like that situation. So it's like, there's always, you know, and a lot of times with my clients, I'm like, it's not just that you want to drink. Like, it's not just there. It's like, it's linked to things inside of you deep down, like that you're trying to mask. And like, that's what we need to unmask. Like, there's always a link to really, you know, why you're wanting to grab for that drink all the time. Beautiful. Thank you for being transparent and thank you for really opening up about that and being direct. I mean, that's a hard thing to say that there's a period in your life where you hated yourself. I mean, I can look back now mm -hmm. and I, I can definitely, I resonate with that, like hardcore. Like there's moments mm -hmm. in my life where I would do things. My, my, I, I never really was like an alcoholic. Like my family has alcoholism in it, mm -hmm. but I would bounce around to other things that that were very unhealthy to escape because there was just this glaring hold in me and so real quick we are going to do the rewind we love unpacking on this show so let's look at natasha growing up like you know we've gotten to this point in july 4th of 2020 where it has exploded and we've had our moment so let's rewind a little bit what was your life like growing up like what kind of household did you grow up in yeah, I, my parents are still together. They're still like so in love, you know, over 30 years of marriage. And so for, you know, for the most part, grew up a very good life, very blessed. And, but there were like, my dad had a job where he, he was gone a lot, you know? Mm. And so mm. I feel like I've learned through therapy and working on myself in these past few years that I feel like some of the reasons why I, my mom was a little bit more strict on me. So I wasn't able to like go out and hang out with friends all the time as much as I would have liked or think. And then my dad would be gone. And like, it's so, it's so crucial to have, you know, that masculine and feminine energy when you're growing up. And so, and it's not, you know, they're also humans and they were doing the best that they could and they yeah. are amazing parents and I love them so much, but I feel like obviously when it comes to like my anxiety or wanting to fit in and wanting to be loved and like, you know, a lot of like the reasons why I drank kind of probably stemmed from like when I was a child and, and feeling like, you know, I wanted to go hang out with my friends or, you know, wanted my dad there and he was at work type of thing. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's fascinating. I, I grew up, my parents are still married, very similar. And it's remarkable to me how a lot of people look at what would be an ideal life and they go mm -hmm. like, well, I mean, you grew up two parents together, worked hard and everything. And then there's still like feelings of fear of abandonment or shame or whatever that can be cultivated just from society and like the yearning of connection in some way. And that's what I feel like you're describing in relation to like your father being gone is like, you have to see him leave all the time. And again, like these are things that like everybody deals with in some plane. And my parents were the same way. They're beautiful people. I love them. Mm -hmm. They look back and they go, you know what? We probably could have done in this and this and this better, but ultimately I truly believe they did their best. I know we mm -hmm. talked a little bit about, because we live in the Midwest and in the Midwest, predominantly people go to church and growing mm -hmm. up, I know I went to church. You said you went to church. What was your experience with faith growing up? I know that we unpacked a little bit like that fear-based narrative. Do you feel like you ran into that at all or like a judgment or shame-based narrative? So I actually really liked my church experience. And, and I feel like because I did find a good gr group of core friends when I would go to church. So 
I had a really good experience and I feel like that's probably why I didn't drink or do certain things that most, you know, probably teenagers do. But but I do feel like because it was just so, you know, strict on me that when I did become 21 and I went off to college, I was like, "Woo!" Like, you know, here we go. So I do feel like I look at everything in life, like no matter maybe how negatively I feel like it impacts me, which, like I said, I feel like church was a positive experience. But I do feel because I was in such like a discipline strict environment that when I did go to college, I was like, woo, the complete opposite. Like, let's go. But I feel like one thing I can say, though, is that my faith has carried me out even if I didn't feel like I was very aligned with my faith throughout my journey it, it's been something that has really held me up throughout my journey even when I wasn't feeling very you know focused in on it absolutely I completely agree with you and that's a great way to dissect it whenever it comes to because in the Midwest, you have a lot of people that are raised in the church, right? I mean, their their parents have a relationship or a faith-based relationship, regardless of what your religion is. Like, there's some kind of structure in church. And I feel like there's, for me growing up, like, it was a let's protect and let's shelter from all of these things, which have some very positive attributes because I, too, look through my life and I see that faith, like those principles added in. But... The second that a youthful brain or like a person gets a taste of freedom and they have not been mm -hmm. equipped with the knowledge needed to combat all of these emotions and new experiences coming at them, it can be very hard to fight through that. And, you know, I think that a lot of kids in the Midwest, you talk to them and like, they don't understand like why exactly like these things happen whenever they grew up in that kind of environment. And I think a lot of it is just being a little bit sheltered and a little bit in a controlled environment to where they didn't get the chance to like experience what a personal faith walk looks like. And so yeah. I think that was a, I think that was a great description whenever it comes to your faith and you know, I, I, that's awesome. So your dad was gone a little bit. Your mom was very present. What was high school leading up to college like for you? You had a four-year boyfriend, <laughs> apparently. So, Yeah, yeah, on and off. But yeah, high school was also a decent experience. I feel like high school is kind of where I felt like I was, I was starting to fit in and like feel like I was a part of the cool crowd and like being loved and, you know. So high school was, I, I went to private school for a little bit at first. And then I, my sophomore year, I was actually went to private school and in middle school growing up. And then my sophomore year of high school is when I went to a public school, which I was like, yes. <laughs> so high school was a good experience. Like I said, I, I didn't really, I didn't drink, but I did hang out with people that did drink. But I feel like because of that strict structure with church and like my faith, I was, that's why I was able to not drink at that time like I didn't want to drink at that time like I was like nope like I was that girl that people would call prude in high school but and then when I got to college is when I just started like drinking and party I drank a sorority I was on palm like and, and those atmospheres were at that time and I still think they are but very surrounded around drinking so yeah lots of partying in college that's for sure <laughs> So yeah, I was dude, same way. I mean, I, I personally had a completely different experience. I had my first drink of alcohol when I was 13 years old, for goodness sake, like mm. not, not known to my parents. We moved to a neighborhood and it was funny cause I went to a private school too. I met a lot of private school kids and I think my first drink was at the Valley in Quail Creek, which is where all the cool kids would go to drink and party. And I think that was the first time I ever drank alcohol. I hid it from my parents for a long time. It wasn't really my thing. I ended up getting into pot and other escapism routes, but I, I, speaking of this interview, which I think is really cool, as we jump into that first moment that you drank, this, this, this neuroscientist I listened to earlier, her explanation was earlier the exposure to alcohol, the more that it can seem like a solution to problems that we have not yet experienced. Mm. And I, I look back and I think I, I look at a lot of relationships I've had with people who have been alcohol dependent and like, it seems like a solution. The first time you drink it, you're like, wow, like I feel great. 
I don't feel like I'm socially awkward. I feel like I'm free. I feel like I fit in. I'm more fun. I don't have as much inhibition. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go run around the parking lot screaming with my head off. I'm going to go <laughs> to the club and now I can dance and do all the things that whenever I'm sober, I can't do. Is that, you know, whenever you hit 21, are those some of the things that you started running into? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Because like I said, I used to have really bad social anxiety, anxiety in general. And, and fitting in was just like a core wound of mine that I felt like I needed. So when I was able, when I started drinking, I, it gave me that liquid courage, as everybody says. <laughs> I was able to be that fun person that, that, you know, talk, I was able to talk more and like dance and like, talk to guys that I probably didn't need to be talking to. And like, I was, yeah, I felt more free spirited at that time and confident. So the first time you drank is 21, which is unbelievable, by the way. Like, I mean, I, I think that's, that's not the norm. That's no, no, <laughs> no, it's not the norm. Yeah, <laughs> no, it's, it's really not. And like, it's fascinating to me because like, even though you waited until 21 and this kind of <laughs> goes back to that, what I was talking about when it comes to your brain, like being neuroelastic, like your brain was still developing. Like you were still laying mm -hmm. down a lot of groundwork whenever it came to your neurotransmitters. So like whether you're starting at 13 or 21, all the way up to 25, your brain is still like really developing. And I think that you see so many kids that were, I know so many kids that were really good kids in high school and then they go to college. And the next thing you know, I mean, it's almost like that taboo thing. You see the kid in, in it was like the good kid in high school that you're like, well, our kid's getting married early and he's doing this and he's doing this. And the next thing you <laughs> yeah. know, it's like you, you turn around and you see him at the club and you're like, oh my God, it was zero to one million real freaking quick. Um, <laughs> and I, you know, I mean, again, like I, I don't, it's, it's not my job to talk about how anybody parents anybody or whatever, but I do think that I look at like, I, I've got a daughter and I, I really am going to make sure I'm intentional when it comes to like, if she gets pressured in situations and if she's going through, like, I want it to be a safe space for, she can come talk to me about that. Right. Like yeah. there won't be judgment if like your friends get tempted. Like I want to be the parent that you can come talk to. I'm not going to let you drink. I'm not going to encourage you to drink for goodness sake because your brain's still in development. But if you're going through hard situations, come talk to me with absolutely zero judgment towards you or your kids. That way that we can prepare you for that next step of life in college whenever you do mm -hmm. have freedom. Yeah. And so, and so you're, you're 21, you start getting a taste of the toxin, if you will. What was, what was going through like, you know, your, your, your later college years into your professional career I mean, how do you, can you look back and really kind of see how it like started accelerating over time? Yeah. I mean, alcohol is an addictive substance, you know? So I feel like I always say I carried out my college years into like my adult years. I, I basically, I mean, I was my senior presentation in college. I was drunk for like, I was, wow. it was to the point I was drinking in class. Like, and so, and moments like that, it's like, we actually won, like our presentation won out of everybody. So things like that, it's like, well, whatever, like, we're I'm still doing great in life. Like, even though I was drunk for my presentation, we won. So it, when things like that happen, I feel like it's easier to stay in that, that lifestyle, obviously. So, but yeah, once I got out of college and in my adult life, I, I think for the first year, I worked a desk, like a corporate job which that's like, so not my thing. And so I was just working that job from eight to five and then going and drinking at happy hour or just finding any reason to drink. And then on weekends, going out with my friends to the bars and going to brunch, like what was, what's normal, especially, I mean, you live in Oklahoma, you know, that's like, that's just, what else is there to do? <laughs> so, <laughs> and then I became a flight attendant, which, you know, everybody's like oh aviation like yeah you're traveling all the time going to these cool places and all that so of course keep like, of course i'm gonna keep drinking and like you know it's always so funny because i used to say this too it's like well my job is like just surrounded by alcohol my job but i realized this is my personal opinion it is just so normalized in society you could point out any job in this world 
and it's surrounded by alcohol because we are surrounded by alcohol. So I could be like, well, in my job, I'm traveling all the time, going to all these, I want to drink. But like, at the end of the day, it's an excuse. And it's like, okay, we're, you could go to yoga in the park and there's going to be wine at it. (laughs) Like, you know, so it doesn't matter who you, if you're, you know, you're, you're, you're working a corporate job or sales or, 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 if you're a nanny, you're going to find a reason to drink type of thing. And that's exactly what I did. Like I kept finding different, well, I'm going on this international trip. Might as well be, you know, drinking their wine. That's the thing to do. Or like, I'm really stressed from flying these passengers. So like I deserve, me and my crew, we deserve to have drinks type of thing. So it just carried out throughout my my adult life too until it, you know, and, and then, you know, the 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 episodes actually, when I think about when the episodes happen, they they started happening from when I first started drinking. It's just that over time mm. it got worse, mm. and and you know it got to that point where it was like, all right, by the grace of God, for some reason I was like, enough is enough. Yeah, and that's awesome because I I shared with you before we came in here. I've got some friends that were alcoholics and became addicts, and some of the nicest people I've ever met, like one of my really good mm-hmm. buddies, like for anonymity reasons, I'm not going to share details on him, but like, dude, I remember I met him in club business. He was probably one of the most generous people I've ever met financially, very well off, became really, really, really close. And I, there was multiple times where I would be out with him and he would go from being super happy to super depressed. Like that. Mm -hmm. And I mean, he was on some SSRIs and some other medication that you're not supposed to be drinking on anyway, because your body goes into freak out mode, you know, and he was doing other substances, but like, even though he was like this super wealthy individual, he had what seemed like the dream job. He had Ferraris, he had the nice house, he had all the greatest things that you can think of. And he was so lonely and he had like this giant hole in his soul to where like, when you looked at him and like, you looked him in the eyes, like you could just see there was no hope, you know? And like, I, it was, I ended up having to walk away from that friendship because I'm an enabler. And so like, you know, that that's just kind of my personality. And I've, I've worked through that a lot. I'm codependent. Like these are, these are things that I've worked through over the years. And, uh, you know, he ended up taking his own life and uh, it was mm-hmm. one of those things. Like I remember hearing the story and I just, I just grieved that moment because like he was such just a beautiful soul and had all the things in the world that you think you want, but he couldn't kick the addiction because there was Mm -hmm. that hole, like that hate, that anger that like wasn't fully healed. And I listened to your story when it comes to being this flight attendant, you know, you're, you're a beautiful girl that's flying all over the world. You're doing corporate aviation, which is like a completely different kind of aviation. I don't know if you were at the time, but like, you're getting to travel all over the world. You're getting to drink whatever you want. You're, you have the life, right? Mm-hmm. And there's still a hole there that you're trying to fill. You're running away from your calling, that purpose. Like, and mm-hmm. then you hit a wall and all of a sudden it's like, oh my God, like, how did I get here? So yeah. let's, let's talk about that moment a little bit. Like, what happened? Yeah. Yeah. So the moment, the last day I drank. Yeah. Like what happened? Like just, just all of it, like the emotion involved, like leading up to that moment, like like what happened? (laughs) Yeah. I, I, and it's crazy because I remember it was for, I'd already known because my, my, my episodes become more and more over the years. So in that last year or two, this was during COVID like beginning of COVID. Mm. So I was one of those people. It's like, I feel like either people slow down on their drinking or they up their drinking. I upped my drinking and I was just drinking like a little psychopath or whatever, (laughs) but my episodes just got worse. Like, Mm. and, and by episodes, I mean, I would be that person that when I would get mad when I was drunk, that flip would switch. And there was most times there was no coming back. Like I was just such a mean, hateful person. And I had a lot of people actually walk out of my life over the course of those years because I just was selfish and mean and and not all the time. There's a reason why some of those people stayed in my life for as long as, you know, 
they did because when I was sober, they saw the goodness, just like you said about your friend. It's like, we're not bad people. It's just the alcohol turns us into these, just, 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 it brings out all of our insecurities and like, you know, and so I had already been having more and more episodes leading up to that 4th of July. And I distinctly remember waking up with so much anxiety on that morning and, and me and, and, my current boyfriend at the time, like we were getting ready to go to like a 4th of July party with a bunch of people. And I just remember being so anxious and being so worried, like, oh, I don't want to have another episode. I don't want to start another fight. Like, you know, so I remember going outside and like being like, all right, I'm going to meditate. And so I meditated before and I just like sat outside in nature and I was like, okay, I'm not going to drink. I'm going to limit myself. I'm not going to drink that much. And then fast forward, you know, it, it was a shit show. I got really, really drunk, drank more than I wanted, and just was so mean to people, acting a fool, acting crazy, starting with fights, multiple fights. And, and just really, and you can go to, you know, my Instagram, and, and I'm very open about that story. And, and obviously, if people want to know the details. I don't feel like I need to go full on detail, but I'm, you know, if somebody wants to talk one on one, I will. But, you know, it, it by the end of that night, I just made a complete fool of myself. Mm. And I did things I would have never done and said things I would have never said if I wasn't drinking. And I just remember getting back to my friend's place and just hating myself to the point of like, I should die. Like it was, you know, it was one of those where it was like, I don't deserve to live. Like, I don't even want to be here. Like the pain was so bad and what's crazy is that I still wanted to drink and at that time still and I was doing drugs at that time so I wanted to drink and do drugs and like in that like terrible state of making complete fool of myself and like you know just being a wreck I still was craving the drug because alcohol is a drug too so I was still was craving it so I remember waking up that morning and I mean, I just, it's an indescribable, like that pain was just, I was so full of shame and regret and like just hating myself and what I did and said and all the other times I'd, like it all just came crashing on me and I was just like, I, and, and the fact that I still, and one of the big things for me too was that I was acting so crazy that day that I'm like, I could have easily mistakenly like hurt somebody or just, it could have gone way worse. Even though it was really bad still, it could have gone way worse than that. But that was like enough for me to just finally be like, wow, you're feeling this down, yet you're still craving it. And you might actually have an issue then. <laughs> wow. Dude, thank you so much for being transparent. And I, we've brought this up two times. And so I always like saying this, if you ever are in that position where you're thinking about harming yourself or you're thinking that you're not enough or thinking about that, like there are people in the 988 hotline that will listen to you. There are people there that care about you. You are valuable. God cares about you. We care about you. If you're ever in that position, reach out to someone because mm -hmm. I promise you whatever you're going through other people, just like what Natasha described have gone through similar situations and there is victory on the other side of whatever darkness you're in. Like, trust mm -hmm. me, there is. So Natasha, you, uh, you hit rock bottom, you're an emotional wreck and you've had enough. Mm -hmm. What did you do? Yeah. So what I did was sit in my room in the darkness, actually at my parents' house for like, a, like, you know, I just, I was like, I was down and depressed, but what's wild. And this is like, I think the beauty of when you start your journey of wanting to better yourself, things, things are not coincidences. Like, it to this day, over three years sober, the way I don't even look at them as coincidences anymore. I'm like, yeah, all right, it just makes sense that this happened and this is falling into place. But so that moment I made the decision that morning, literally two or three days before that, this girl that I had always admired, I was like, she's so cool. Cause at that time, I wasn't a corporate flight attendant yet. 
Okay. So she's from Oklahoma. She became a corporate flight attendant, living this like awesome life. And I'm like, she is so cool. So anyway, I'd always admired her. And, and so probably two or three days before the 4th of July, like I said, I didn't know anybody that was sober. And so I was on Facebook and she posted a, I believe it was a two year sobriety post. But that's the first time she had ever posted about being sober. And so I remember looking at that post, you know, two or three days before 4th of July and being like, I could never do that. But like, good for her. Like, wow. And then, and that's the first time I'd seen somebody who I admired, who I thought was so cool. And like, I loved her. And then saying that they're sober. And that was the first time she had shared that. Fast forward, morning of July 5th. And I'm like, well, what do I do? Like, I feel like I need to stop drinking. I actually need to stop. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm going to reach out to her. So that was just divine timing, like planning. Um, And I reached out to her and she was the first, you know, person that really guided me and helped me throughout my journey. We're still friends to this day. And yeah, after that, just taking, you know, all the small steps towards that's the thing, just taking it day by day mm. and like taking those small steps, reaching out, like you said, reaching out to that one person, just reach out to somebody. And, and yeah, and that's, that's what started the whole journey. I, I do. That's beautiful. It's, it's so beautiful. Like regardless of what your faith and what your belief is, like I've got my faith and Natasha's got hers. I've got a personal relationship with Jesus. Like that's what I believe in. But like, when you, when, when you hit rock bottom and like you said, like you start living, like you realize you have purpose. Mm-hmm. You realize the fact that you don't need anything else that like you are enough. Like, and it's like, it starts at like, you know, in your thirties or it could start, it could start at any point in life. And it's that realization of the fact that like, there is a completely different world out there. I call them God incidences. Like I don't call them coincidences. Mm. I call it God incidents because like it's an incidents that only God could have orchestrated or whatever your belief is. Like that is like the moment I I've had, I've had my past few podcasts. One of them was Kayla Fascio and she talked about, she walks into this store. So like, she's like a super, like she's starting to be intentional and looking for transformation and ends up finding a book that was the exact book that she needed to read in order to start her healing journey. She wasn't even looking for the book, just walking through the store and goes, well, that really resonates with me. I need to do that. You've got your story where all of a sudden you're like, I saw that post three days ago. Oh my God, I'm going to reach out to this person. Like, dude, that is not coincidence. Like that is divine intervention, but you have to be intentional and you have to look for it. And it's beautiful. Like I am not, I am someone who I'm actually, I told you I'm going sober for December. I don't drink a lot as it is maybe once in a blue moon, but I'm really considering just going completely sober because when you, when you really start looking around, like, and you get that sober mindset, like I know a lot of sober people and like, it opens this entire new world that you didn't even know existed. Like it's Mm -hmm. crazy. Like it goes, it's like, Oh my God, like this is not only possible. This is a path that like I can see myself on. So that happens. You reach out to her. That was three years ago. Why don't you tell us about, and, and the stacking thing is so important. Why don't, why don't you tell us about like some habits that you've put in your life over the last years? Like, tell us about what that journey has been like. Oh my gosh. I mean, it's been, it's been a magical adventure, <laughs> you know, like, I mean, it's been beautiful and ugly and hard and like, but wonderful at the same time. Like I, sobriety has like, which is why I'm so vocal about it. Like it has changed my life for the better. And, and you know, it, it is just so many different parts that have contributed, you know, throughout this journey. And it really, what's that saying? Like just having faith, like the size of a mustard seed, like just putting in that little bit of willingness to work on yourself and better yourself, like things will like with your friend Kayla, like pop up like that book, like it will happen, you know? And just, um, so for me, I, in the beginning, I, I got into AA and, and I still actually do AA and um, AA was a huge, for me, it helped a lot, you know, and then I also listened to a lot of podcasts. I read a lot of books. I'm like looking at all my books right now. 
I listened to people like Jay Shetty, just like very influent. I just dove deep, which even when I was drinking, I was like still into like spirituality and things like that. But obviously when I got sober, it's like, I don't have anything to numb myself from the world. So a lot of times I say when you're numbing yourself from the negative things in life, you're also numbing yourself from positive things in life. That's good. That's good. So, so yeah, I just took it in AA. They said, just take it one. They have all these things. And I remember hearing these dang sayings and being like, ah, <laughs> but then I remember sitting in those rooms and being like, seeing this peace. And I was like, I need that peace. I need Ooh. that. They just seem so content with just like, what, like just sitting there. Like I need that piece. And then, you know, and then also motivation of watching the people who, you know, a lot of people are like, well, people in AA are like in their sixties and seventies, like they're all old and like, they just, they don't understand. They're not. And I'm like, yeah, but they, I look at the older people. I'm like, they started like us, like in their twenties and thirties and like, oh, I'm not that bad. Cause it's so normalized. So that was also motivation to stay sober too. Like, and, and so, yeah, doing, being and it doesn't have to be AA. Be just in any type of sober community. Like now it's more so, I even took a break from AA for a while. And then now I'm back and doing like, you know, online type of meetings with just women. And, and you know, that works for me. And And now I'm really big in like creating like healthy habits. Because a lot of like back when I was drinking, it was unhealthy habits and like not another reason why I call myself a sober purpose coach, because I feel like it's not only about cutting out the drug or the alcohol, or whatever the addiction is, but it's finding what you're passionate about, finding hobbies, being of service, finding a lot of times when people get sober, they're like, what do I do? Drinking was my life. It was all I did. It was how I, that's how I have, how are you supposed to have fun? Like I'm going to be boring now. And it's like, no, it's like the complete opposite. You just have to put yourself out there and work on yourself and find different things that you enjoy. And um, yeah, so routine and habits and, and being in a community. And um, yeah, those are probably some of the main and then my spirituality, obviously, like my relationship with God has been huge in helping me stay sober and helping other people get sober too, which is hence why I decided to be a coach. <laughs> Dude, that's so beautiful. I, I just that is just so it's so cool to hear. Like it's, it's such a unique story. And another thing I want to bring up, cause you talk about like, you know, the fact that like sobriety is fun and everything. And like you post stuff, like, it's not like you lock yourself in a cage in your room anymore. Like you still travel the world. You're still mm -hmm. on these corporate jets. Like you're still living like a fulfilled life, but like, you can just see the glow. Like you can just see it in you. Like there's just a glow about you that is just such a beautiful energy and oh, like thank you yeah dude you're so welcome like it's just it's so like conveying and like it's it just connects so like i mean because mm, you still go out and have fun you. so like why don't you why don't you share with people like like because you still go to like music festivals and stuff don't you like i mean you mm -hmm. still like like why don't why don't you talk a little bit about like all the things that you still get to do and experience sober yeah and thank you so i love that you say i still like i connect and that was my main thing when i got sober like I was one of those people who was like, oh my gosh, my life is over. I am I am I gonna be boring now? I'm not gonna be cool anymore. Like even though we're adults, we all feel that way. <laughs> like we're like we want to feel we are humans. Like we are made for connection. And like alcohol, unfortunately, is one of those drugs that have made us feel like we are connected with people. And so I remember feeling all of those things. Or like, well, if I travel to this place, I have to have the wine. Or like. You know, I've even talked to a lot of men where they're like, you know, that's how I bond with the bros. That's how I, that's how I fit in and how I still get invited to the guys nights and stuff like that, or the pressure. Like, the, and so I just remember thinking all those things. I was like, I love to dance. Like I love to socialize. I love to go out. I love to meet new people and talk. And like, so I was like, I'm still going to do it when I'm drinking. Like, it was just a decision that I had made. Like I was like, my life is not going to be boring. <laughs> And so I did, like, I just, I do, I, I obviously I don't go out nearly as much as I used to when I was drinking. I would say I'd probably go out now, like out with friends to like a bar or dancing, maybe once a month or something like that. Cause that's all I need. But now it's like a treat and it's like, you know, 
I've been for that whole month, I'm doing the work on myself and I'm like following my purpose. So it's more so like, a, oh, yeah, I get to go out. And like now it's like a little treat. It's not like a, oh, I need to go out to escape my life. <laughs> so the, 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 the reasoning behind it is a lot different, which and I mean, I love music. I love musical music festivals. So all of those things for me, I wanted to show people they can still have fun without the alcohol. Like you can still go out, like going dancing and going to that music festival or going to the bar and chatting with friends or going to brunch. Like you don't need alcohol to do those things. Like you don't need that crutch. Like you yourself are good enough. Like you can go have fun, but it's all about, you know, your willingness and like being able to be like, you know, and I think that's why the work you do behind the scenes, like a lot of people are like, how are you able to go out and have fun with people and, and you be surrounded by drinking? And I always say it's the work you do outside of it. Like you have to build up. That's why habits are so important. Daily routines are so important because all of those things are building confidence and trust in yourself. So those things that I do outside of going out and having fun, when I am going out and having fun, like. I have that trust and confidence that I have built in myself that if somebody offers me a drink, like I'm just like, when I first got sober, you know, it's easier to say it wasn't easy. In the, I mean, honestly, when I had made the decision, I was like, no, I'm not going to. And I, I if I did hang out with people who were drinking, it was people who supported me. And obviously, if I was out, there would be people that would be like, wow, come on, just have a drink or whatever. But like I said, it's the work that I did outside of it mm. that helped me be able to stand in my no. And, and there were times that I would be out and at the end of the night, somebody would be like, wow, I can't believe you're not drinking. Like, wait, you're actually fun. Like what? <laughs> so. Dude, that's so cool. I, stand in the no. I love that. That's good. That's really good. Stand in the no. That's, that's great. Yeah. And I mean. The only thing I will tell listeners, and this is from my personal experiences with some things that I've cut off in my life multiple times, like you are like change is hard. Like it, it this mm -hmm. is like, this is, this is after, like, I look at Natasha, like this is years of like consistency, years of hard work, lots of cry sessions, lots of intentionality, lots of presence. One of my favorite activities today that I, I practice is if I know that I'm going to have something hard, whether it be like the loss of a loved one or a holiday that I'm celebrating without certain people or whatever it is. I set certain time aside to like really mourn that moment and like feel it fully that way that I can really like be present in that pain and really mm -hmm. allow myself to heal through that pain. Because like when you're healing and when, if you're going, you won't go on the sober journey, there's going to be a lot of memories that are going to pop up that you don't even remember you did. And then, you know, it goes into having to go and ask forgiveness. It's part of the 12 steps, right? And not everybody's going to forgive you. That's the yeah. other thing. Like, dude, like you leave a tornado and insurance isn't always going to cover everything. Like it's, mm -hmm. it's just not. And like, you have to be prepared for that. And those are hard hits that you're going to go through on this healing journey, whether it's alcohol, whether it's drugs, whether it's like, whatever your thing was, whatever your escape is like. When you start unpacking that, it's going to be hard. Like it's not just easy rainbow and butterflies. Like in like those activities that you're going through, through that healing process, having a healthy community, having a faith-based relationship with a higher power, making sure that you're being very intentional with your time, that you start little stab it habit stacking activities like are so vital to getting through that process. And I mean, I'm sure, do you, I mean, do you still struggle with going out and every once in a while, like you have moments to where you're tempted? Going out, I wouldn't say as much, but that's just because I audit myself a lot. So if I'm like, unpack a lot that. Of times, what, what do you mean by auditing? Audit, it's like daily inventory. So I, I very, I check in with myself a lot, basically. Okay. And I'm like, how am I feeling? Why, if I feel triggered from a situation, why am I feeling triggered from this situation? Is it actually that person? Or am I just having like a bad day and that person, you know, set something off? So a lot of times it used to be just at the end of the day, but now I just throughout the day, I just audit myself a lot. So if I'm just like down in the dumps and I'm really not okay, 
that's actually, I get triggered to drink more when I'm like stressed, mad, any type of negative feeling emotion, more so than when I'm going out with friends and having fun. Because I actually love to go out with friends and have fun and be that person that people can can count on and rely on because I wasn't before and like be the the driver, the responsible one or be in control of myself and know what I'm saying, know what I'm doing. So more so I wouldn't say I get triggered when I go out, but that's because I'm auditing myself that if I am down in the dumps and I'm like, oh, I'm just not so great. I'm not going to put myself in a situation that because going out would mean that I'm using that as a way to numb as well. And mm. if I'm doing that when I'm like not feeling okay and can't be my best self, then that could potentially lead to me wanting to drink. Once again, I go out with my friends who fully support me. And I've literally, there have been times somebody offers me a drink and they're like, she doesn't drink. <laughs> like, so my friends are amazing. I don't even think they would tackle me before I grabbed a drink anyway. But for me, I just don't put myself in those situations if I am in such a low place. Mm. If I'm in such a low place where I'm, maybe feeling triggered to drink which does still happen it becomes fewer over time or less and less over time but if it does happen i have healthy coping mechanisms or, or healthy habits to replace them like going the, i don't know about you but the power of going on a walk when you're mad absolutely absolutely woo! yeah facts it does something it does something to you like i swear it works or journaling journaling's or big out, Oh yeah, dude, like, all those, all those. I think, they and you know, <laughs> they, they are. And I think that, you know, Satan will attack you when you're lonely. Like Satan mm -hmm. will attack you when you're alone. Like your insecurities will come up whenever you're at home and you feel like you are the safest. Like that is when you will get an attack. And so making sure you're being very intentional with that time if you are alone is just so yeah. important, so impactful. And is it, journaling's great. Dream journaling's great. Meditation, yoga, like, Finding healthy activities to replace what used to be your lonely time that would revert you to whatever that neuro, you know, neurological pathway that tells you, well, I'm not feeling like myself right now. What neurologically in my hypothalamus am I going to pull from to basically like, like to cope with this? And like, cause your hypothalamus like stores this stuff to where it's like, well, in my hard drive, I know when emotionally I'm feeling this way, that's what I reverted to. And over time, it takes time to repair those neural pathways because you don't have that same, you know, neuroelasticity in your life. So, dude, mm -hmm. thank you so much. We are winding down on time, but thank you so much oh, wow. for being intentional. <laughs> I know, dude, I'm telling you, you, whenever we first got here, you're like, is it going to be like 30, 45 minutes? And like, I dude, and. If you're listening to this, give her an ovation because like she killed it. And this is her first podcast uh -huh. in like forever. And she was nervous and she freaking <laughs> yeah. slaughtered it. Thank you. Thank you. You did great too. Like, I just feel like you're just, I'm having a conversation with a friend, which I, am. so yeah, this has been an amazing experience. Beautiful. All right. So I have two questions we wind down with, and then I'm going to give you your 60 second spiel. Number one, if there's one book you were going to recommend to anyone, what would it be and why? Ooh, The Untethered Soul by Michael Singer. That book will just teach you about how to separate you from your soul from this, this human experience. So basically, it will, it, it's just a spiritual book that'll just open your eyes to what's truly important. And yeah, it's just an amazing book. I highly recommend if you're trying to, you're, you're on the journey of doing inner work and, you know, right. connecting to a higher power or something that that is like, oh, that book is so good. High key recommend. Beautiful. Second question. You got like two minutes to answer these two. Okay. Most impactful person in your life and why? Most impactful person in my life and why? My dad. My dad. And that's because. He's just such a great role model. He's an amazing man. And yeah. It's beautiful. Thank you. I love that, dude. My, my mom by far. So I love that. Those are great. Last thing. You got 60 seconds to look at the camera. We have unpacked why sobriety is the adventure. If there's someone watching this right now, they're sitting there on the edge of their seat. They've listened to this. Tell them what they need to do. Have patience with yourself. It's progress, not perfection. And 
yeah, just don't shame yourself. Don't feel regretful. Any, nothing in life is a mistake. It's just a lesson learned. So the same love and grace that you would give the people that you love the most in this world, give it to yourself. That's beautiful. Short, sweet, and to the point. Natasha Smith, everybody, thank you for coming on the podcast. Go check out her podcast. Go hire her for coaching. And this has been Adam and Natasha on the Backpack Theory podcast. Until next time, we'll see you guys. Awesome. Bye, guys. Thanks, Adam.